Hello everyone, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We welcome you to this Transfiguration Sunday worship. We're glad that you have tuned in and you are joining us today. Uh, we will have during our service a special time of dedication. We have some beautiful new altar candles and I'll be sharing more about those. And uh, we'll have a special time of dedication uh, later on in the service today. Uh, we also want to let you know that there will be a, an online Ash Wednesday service that we will be posting uh, in this coming week. So uh, please watch for that. I'll send out an email link and we'll post it to our Facebook page. And we invite you to join us for online Ash Wednesday worship. And uh, we hope that, uh, hope that that is a blessing to you. Uh, we also today, before we begin uh, our, our liturgy, we want to take a moment and say a special thank you uh, to the Miller family, to uh, Mike and Jen and Liam Miller for all of their hard work in getting our uh, uh, parking lot and uh, walkways cleared of snow. Uh, we've had a lot of snow this week and there's more that's predicted uh, in this coming weekend and they have been putting in a lot of extra time uh, to do that. So we just want to say thanks to the Miller family for their dedication and and for sharing their time to make sure that uh, our parking lot and our walkways are clear and safe. And uh, I want to thank uh, our worship team here uh, uh, worshiping and, and uh, recording uh, today. We have uh, Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer and Garrett Woods, our music director, and we are grateful for their hard work and dedication. And we are grateful to you for uh, joining us for worship today. So now let us turn to God and begin worshiping together. Please join me for our responsive call to worship. Gathering in this sacred place, we anticipate new wonders each week. Wherever two or three are gathered to worship, the Holy Spirit is present. Open our eyes to witness the fantastic love and wondrous joy waiting to be revealed even this day, even in this place. We will want to linger and camp in this sanctuary but when we leave today, may our hearts be open to all the wonders of God's beautiful world. Our first hymn is hymn number 95, Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun.
Please join me as we pray our prayer of invocation. O Holy One, on mountaintops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our heart's desire is to bask in the amazing glory of the divine presence. With each encounter, we are changed and transformed. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of the divine glory. May we walk among our siblings and friends as a blessing, bearing light into dark places, hope to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. Our world is hurting, and we need the followers of Jesus to follow more closely. May we will then hear your voice speaking to us and saying, Listen to my child, the Beloved. Amen. Let us gather before our shining Savior to confess our sins that we might be forgiven. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Forgive, Forgive us, us, God, when, when we linger too long by the waters and on the mountaintops, enthralled with the glory that flows from you, when we fail to listen to your voice, leading and guiding us, shake us from our contentment, and send us forward, endowed with your power. Amen. The God of Elijah, the God of Moses, and the God of Jesus desires mercy more than sacrifice, and a contrite heart rather than burnt offerings. Love God and do the right thing, and forgiveness shall be your friend and mercy, your true companion. Amen. Amen. We've come to a special moment in our worship service. We have been given a, a gift of two beautiful new altar candles. The candles are a gift from Aaron Westermeyer, and they are in memory of his grandmother, Esther Westermeyer, uh, one of our dear uh, congregational members who passed away on December 22nd. And this is a beautiful gift and a beautiful way for Aaron to remember and honor his grandmother and we want to thank Aaron uh, for these beautiful candles. And we know that they will uh, be a blessing to us as we worship. And uh, they will help remind us of the beautiful soul and beautiful life that Esther lived and the beautiful person that she was. And so today we're going to have a prayer of dedication uh, for the altar candles. And, uh, and we will pause a few moments We'll have a few moments of silence, and, uh, and most of you who are watching this knew Esther and loved her, and I will invite you to think about Esther and to remember her, and uh, let us honor her as we, uh, as we uh, uh, celebrate her memory today and as we dedicate these candles. Thank you, Aaron, for this wonderful gift, and I invite you to bow with me as we pray together.
Eternal God, today we thank you for our dear sister in Christ, Esther Westermeyer. We thank you for her dedication to you, her commitment to her Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for her love for you and for all of those that she came into contact with. We thank you for her service to your church here at St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ and all of the churches that Esther was a part of. We are grateful for uh, her many gifts. We are grateful for the way that she blessed all of us and touched all of our lives. We miss her, we honor her today, and we remember her. And we ask for your blessings on these beautiful altar candles that Aaron has gifted to the church in memory of his grandmother. We pray that they would indeed remind us of the light of your love and the light of Esther's life that continues to shine in our hearts and in our souls. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of our loved ones. We thank you for those of our church family who have gone on before us and who are in your loving presence and who are part of the church triumphant. We thank you for the hope that we have in this life and in the next. And we offer this prayer to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we will share our time of pastoral prayer this morning. Uh, as we uh, uh, worship together, we want to remember uh, all of those prayer concerns that we bring here to worship today. You have many needs and concerns that I'm sure, I'm sure you uh, uh, have on your hearts. And so I uh, invite you to think of those, to lift those up to God. Uh, we're joining together, even if we don't know all of each other's needs and concerns and joys, we can still pray together and still lift them up together. And we do invite you, if you would like to share a prayer request online, to utilize the link that is right below the video, and we will include your prayer request in our weekly email uh, that we send out, and also we'll remember your prayer concern uh, at our in-person worship on Sunday mornings here at, at the church. I invite you now to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. O oh Lord of infinite mercy, we are mindful today that this is Transfiguration Sunday, and we are reminded once again of the powerful event that took place on the mountaintop in which three of Jesus' disciples witnessed His transfiguration. And like them, we sometimes are not sure what to do with those mountaintop experiences that we have those wondrous and blessed experiences in which you touch our hearts and reveal new things to us. Sometimes, like Peter, we are in a hurry to uh, uh, build booths to remember those events, and yet you invite us to leave the mountaintop and to head back down into the world that you have called us to serve. Help us to serve faithfully. Help us to return after those blessed experiences to the hurting world that you so love. Help us look at Jesus and one another with new eyes, eyes that see him in light of the witness of the ages, that see Jesus as the one who comes to set people free, to heal, to bring hope and peace. Make us ready to become faithful disciples rather than remaining dazzled by the mountaintop experience. Give us strength and courage this day to witness to Jesus' love by the many deeds of mercy and justice that we could offer in His name. For we are, offer ourselves imperfect but willing to serve. And now in these moments of silence, O oh God, we ask that you would hear each of the prayers that we offer to you. And now let us pray together in song.
We offer all of these prayers to you, O God, and in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 3. The apostle writes, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading today is from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm joined in the chapel here by a fellow Andy Griffith fans, so I know that they're going to appreciate this. Uh, April 29th, 1963, the Andy Griffith episode that aired that evening uh, was an episode called Mountain Wedding, uh, and it was voted one of the top ten favorite episodes of Andy Griffith fans. Mountain Wedding featured the Darling family, or Darlin family as they uh, referred to themselves, the folks from the mountain who played bluegrass music and featured the real-life bluegrass band from Missouri, the Dillards, playing the Darling Boys along with Denver Pyle as their father, Briscoe Darlin, and Maggie Peterson as their sister, Charlene Darlin. In Mountain Wedding, Charlene is engaged to Dud Wash, and they are planning to be married, but Ernest T. Bass has other plans. He is in love with Charlene, and he is determined to stop the wedding, and he's going to make Charlene his bride. He's, he's determined. Well, Sheriff Andy Taylor, in his creative wisdom, devises a plan. On the day of the wedding, he has Deputy Barney Fife dress up in Charlene's wedding dress with a, a heavy veil covering his face. When Ernest T. Bass goes to abduct Charlene and carry, carry her off to make her his wife, he actually carries off Barney in the wedding dress. And while he's carrying Barney away, Charlene and Dud quickly get married uh, by the preacher. And while the real wedding is taking place, we see Barney with the wedding dress on and the heavy veil over his face, sitting on the ground while Ernest T. pledges his love and loyalty. And suddenly Barney throws off the veil and he says to a stunned and confused Ernest T. Bass, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. Well, a veil can cover much, can't it? A veil can obscure sight and it can keep us from seeing what is actually there. On this Transfiguration Sunday, as we have heard these two passages from the New Testament, 
we are reminded that the transfigured Jesus is lifting the veil from our eyes and enabling us to see God and to see one another more clearly. Transfigure, to transfigure, means to transform into something more beautiful or elevated. And that's what happened on that day of transfiguration that we remember today. New Testament scholar Sarah Henrich playfully compares the account of the transfiguration in Mark to the story of a superhero. The superhero genre of literature, which includes figures like Superman and Wonder Woman, depict characters with superhuman strength and abilities who are more suited than average people to do battle with evil supervillains. Supervillains are those who, like superheroes, have superhuman abilities, but who are determined to use their abilities for evil rather than for good. Superheroes are committed to using their powers for good and for the protection of all people and the world. Oftentimes a superhero will have another identity and day -to -day, a day-to-day -day identity like Clark Kent who's known to the public but is actually Superman and the reader is privy to the superhero's secret identity as well as their public identity. People may see Clark Kent, but we know, the reader knows, that Clark Kent is really Superman. People may see Diana Prince, but we know that Diana Prince is actually Wonder Woman. And why do we need superheroes according to super, the superhero genre of popular literature and film? Well, obviously it takes a superhero to combat a supervillain. We are reminded that there is evil in the world. We're reminded that there are forces that would like to destroy and conquer for their own purposes. And those supervillain powers that are bent on conquering the world could only be resisted by power and determination greater than, uh, that, is, that is greater than theirs. With that in mind, Sarah Henrik reminds us that inherent in the story of the transfiguration is the promise of a kind of life beyond what is parent to earthly eyes most of the time. And we are reminded that Jesus is the one who is capable, the one who is ready, the one who is able to do battle with the forces of evil that would destroy us and to give us life and to give us life and hope once again. We have in Mark this amazing account of the transfiguration, that special moment in which Peter and James and John were privy to something spectacular that all of the church and the world would eventually be privy to as well. While on a mountaintop retreat with Jesus, these three disciples who made up a kind of inner circle within the inner circle witnessed a transfiguration, a transfiguration of Jesus. They saw Jesus in a glorified state, an elevated state in which they had never seen him before. And during this transfigure transfiguration moment, Jesus appeared to his friends in a splendid way with his clothes appearing to be dazzling white, whiter than anything Clorox could bleach white. And next to Jesus was Elijah and Moses, two towering figures from Israel's past, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. And these two figures were also important in the minds and the hearts of ancient Israelites because each of them departed this world in a shroud of mystery. Elijah, we read in 2 Kings, was taken bodily into heaven. And Moses, we find in Deuteronomy, was buried by God and his grave was never found. There was a tradition among the Israelites at this time that Moses and Elijah would be sent back to the world by God to herald the reign of God and to mark the close of the age that is passing away, pointing to the new world that God is creating. In other words, the eschaton or what we would call the final things or the end times. What a sight that must have been for Peter and James and John to behold. We're told by Mark that the three disciples on the mountaintop were terrified. And in his fear and uncertainty about what was happening, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Maybe we'll just stay up here on the mountaintop. And Mark says Peter made the offer because he didn't know what else to say. But although Peter did not know what to say, God knew what to say at that moment. God had a word for Peter and James and John, and all of us would become privy, privy to this amazing transfiguration moment.
we read that a cloud came over them and a voice from the cloud spoke, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And in this transfiguration moment, who Jesus is becomes more clear to Peter and James and John and to each one of us reading and hearing this portion of Mark's Gospel. In his second letter to the Corinthian church, St. Paul writes that even if our Gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And he goes on to explain that the God of this world has blinded people from seeing the light of the Gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Peter and James and John had the veil lifted from their eyes and they saw something that we all would eventually see in this narration of the, the transfiguration of Jesus. Isn't it wonderful to have the veil lifted from our eyes and to be able to see what we could not see before? Britney Spears is a 39-year-old pop star who's been in the spotlight for over two decades. At the age of 11, she was cast in the Mickey Mouse Club, and her recording career began when she was a teenager. At one time, I heard a lot of Britney Spears' music because my older daughter, Christina, uh, was a devoted Britney Spears fan when she was a little girl, so I heard Britney Spears quite often. Britney Spears, over the years, has sold many albums and performed many concerts, She's appeared in television and film, and she's had a very successful career. Britney Spears, although, is, is also human. And in the mid-2000s, around 2006 to 2007, the famed pop star experienced a number of personal struggles. After becoming a young mother to her two young sons and going through marital and relationship problems, Britney found herself going through rehabilitation for apparent substance abuse and addiction. For a while, she lost physical custody of her two young sons to her ex-husband, Kevin Federline. And her career, career and her financial affairs were placed in a conservatorship in the hands of her father, Jamie Spears. Britney Spears' struggles uh, were the subject of uh, many news stories at that time. And recently, a documentary was released about Britney Spears, produced by the FX television network in the New York Times. The subject of the documentary is the ongoing conservatorship of Britney's career and financial assets by her father. And there is a free Britney movement that has appeared online and promoted by many of her fans with the hope of restoring Britney Spears to personal and professional autonomy. One famous moment in which Britney Spears shaved her head became the subject of jokes for late night comedians. She shaved her head. She had a lot of tattoos uh, 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 placed on her, and 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 a lot of a lot of comedians had a had a field day uh, poking fun at Britney Spears because of uh, because of those actions. One late night comedian at the time, however, looked at Britney Spears' situation very differently. At the height of Britney's personal struggles, and when comedians and media outlets were focusing on those struggles. Scottish-American comedian and actor Craig Ferguson was hosting The Late Late Show on CBS, and follow, which followed The Late Show with David Letterman at that time. With the documentary about Britney Spears being viewed by many, uh, there has been renewed interest in her personal and professional challenges, and recently a clip of a monologue that Craig Ferguson did on The Late Late Show in 2007 has reemerged and has been going viral on the Internet and in social media. In that monologue, Craig Ferguson acknowledges that he and other comedians have used the struggles of celebrities as comedic fodder. But Ferguson went on to say that he regretted poking fun at people who were going through personal crises, and that it is not right to ridicule those who are vulnerable, as he said. He stated that he wanted his comedy to not be at the expense of those who were down. Craig Ferguson then went on to tell of his own personal struggles with alcoholism and how he had just marked 15 years of sobriety thanks to the support of others who had gone through similar experiences. Craig Ferguson pointed out that Britney Spears was the mother of two young sons and only 25 years old at the time. Tonight, he said in his monologue, no Britney Spears jokes. This woman has two kids. 
She's 25 years old. She's a baby herself. She's a baby, Craig Ferguson said. In that very powerful monologue, Craig Ferguson challenged the way that comedy is often done. He also did something else that was important. He challenged the way that we all look at one another. The tragic circumstances of Britney Spears' life were viewed by comedians as material for jokes. But Craig Ferguson, reflecting on his own journey, came to realize that Britney Spears and anyone else going through substance abuse and addiction, Britney Spears and anyone else going through marital and family problems, Britney Spears and anyone else seeing their life fall apart should not be viewed as the subject of a joke, but should be seen and understood as a human being, a vulnerable, hurting, broken human being who deserves our compassion and not our ridicule. Craig Ferguson was having and sharing with his audience and his viewers a transfiguration kind of moment. He was lifting the veil in a way and helping us all to see more clearly what is right before us and who is right before us. He was reminding us of our shared humanity, whether we are rich or poor or somewhere in between, whether we are a famous celebrity or someone known primarily within our own family and community circles, whatever age, gender, race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, whatever political ideology or philosophy or social outlook, Craig Ferguson reminded us all that we are in fact human. And when we are seeing someone's life fall apart, our humanity demands something more of us than to laugh or to ridicule. Our shared humanity demands that we regard one another with compassion and open hearts. And as followers of Jesus, our discipleship demands more from us. We are to look upon the world as Jesus looked upon the world, and to look upon our neighbors as Jesus looks upon our neighbors, with a view to heal and to help, not to inflict more pain and suffering. The Apostle Paul reminds us that we do not always see others and see life and see the gospel itself very clearly because a veil is hanging over our eyes. But when we look to Christ... When we look to the transfigured Jesus, who, Paul says, is the image of God, and we proclaim him as Lord, then the light shines in the darkness, and that light shines in our hearts, as Paul says, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Just as Peter and James and John had their moment of clarity on the mountaintop, and just as Craig Ferguson had a moment of clarity and invited us to join him, in that moment of clarity in 2007 on late night television, may we ask the transfigured Christ today to lift the veil from our eyes so that we can see God and each other more clearly. So that we may see each other's struggles and see our own struggles in, (coughs) excuse me, in each other. So that we regard one another with love and compassion, not as objects of ridicule or objects to be used for our own interests, and our own purposes. Scott Suskovic says this about Transformation Sunday uh, and these two passages that we read. He says, when you come face to face with some huge obstacle, some daunting problem, something frightening in which the odds are stacked against you, what is your first step? Do you go around it? We learned that as a kid walking home, didn't we? If there, were, if there was a big mean dog on the route, we would walk blocks around it to get home safely. How about now? Do you still walk around those big, mean dogs? Some people go over them. That is, you know the problem is there, but you just scratch the surface, gloss over the problem, brush up against it, but don't really address it. It's just always there, and, you're, and you minimize the danger. It's no big deal. I'm fine. Some people decide to go under it. They bury their heads into the ground and don't even acknowledge it, don't even name it. If I don't talk about it, Maybe it'll just go away, but pretty soon the problem suffocates you with its weight. People with eyes of faith grow through it. They can see what others cannot see. They name the problem, identify the problem, stare that problem right in the eye, and decide that the only way to conquer this problem and to get to the other side is to go through it. On this Transfiguration Sunday, the three disciples' eyes were opened 
they saw what others could not see. There on the mountaintop they saw Jesus in all of His glory. Even though they stumbled and were often filled with doubt, they now had the eyes of faith. And Paul and Mark and Jesus our Lord invite us today to see with the eyes of faith. William Dunkel says he, this, he, say, he writes, A visitor to Albert Schweitzer's mission state, station in equatorial Africa saw a battered old piano. Extreme heat and humidity had almost destroyed it. The ivories on the keyboard were fastened with screws. A dozen or more strings were missing. It was capable of clattering only music marred with tinniness of tone and horribly out of tune. That is until Albert Schweitzer sat down to play. He was not only a skilled physician, but a renowned master of box music. Only he could bring alive and even a pitifully ravaged instrument the glorious chords of Bach's great music. As only God's infinite grace can restore the worst of us to usefulness, even beauty, he shares his glory. You and I may see an old battered piano, but Albert Schweitzer saw an instrument that still held the promise of making beautiful music that would honor God. You and I, with veil, with veil over our eyes, may look to our neighbors and see only someone who's broken or someone who's different than we are or someone we regard as the object of our distrust or the object of our scorn or the object of our ridicule. But if we will join Jesus on the mountaintop and witness along with James and John and Peter his transfiguration, we will see God and our neighbors differently. We will see our neighbors with hearts of compassion and love and with the same grace and mercy that God extends to us. We will see with spiritual eyes, eyes open to the world, and the world's people God so dearly loves. Amen. I invite you to join me now as we affirm our faith and say together the uh, statement of faith, we are a pilgrim people that comes to us from our sisters and brothers in Australia. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We proclaim Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, confessing him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we acclaim Jesus as the Lord of the church, the head over all things, the beginning of a new creation. We acknowledge that we live and work between the time of Christ's death and resurrection and the final consummation of all things which he will bring. We are a pilgrim people, always on the way towards the promised goal. On the way, Christ feeds us with word and sacrament, and we have the gift of the Spirit in order that we may not lose the way. We will live and work within the family and unity of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, bearing witness to that unity, which is both God's gift and his will. We affirm that every member of the church is engaged to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together with all the people of God, we will serve the world for which Christ died, and we await with hope the day of the Lord Jesus. Our next hymn is hymn number 586, Open My Eyes That I May See. Oh, 
voices of truth thou sendest clear, and while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me My God, thy will to see. Open my heart, illumine me, Spirit divine. Peter offered to build a tabernacle on the mountain with Jesus, but God does not dwell in houses made with human hands. Let us offer ourselves in service to those that God loves. Let us offer our sacrifices to build community, bring peace, and be a double blessing to those in need throughout the world. Please join me for our prayer of dedication. With, With these, these gifts, gifts we, we proclaim, proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus, Jesus and we, we commit ourselves to follow a way that leads to love and life. May our sacrifice bear witness to our love for each other and the God who loves us all. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 643, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot.
you very much for being with us today. Sisters and brothers in Christ, now may the God who said, let, let light shine out of darkness and has shown in our hearts, give us light to bear to the world so that all may know that God is love. Go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Love. 